What's up, everybody? Welcome to Heresy Financial. My name is Joe Brown, and today we are looking at news that has been coming out over the last couple of days of extraordinary losses at a hedge fund that's actually spilling over into banks. The hedge fund in question is Archigos Capital, which has triggered losses in stocks that the hedge fund itself had to sell. Stocks like Viacom, Discovery, Baidu, Tencent Music, sometimes losses up to 50% over the last couple of days in these stocks. Even worse, this is threatening the balance sheets of some banks, some of which are globally systemically important banks, GSIBs, banks like Deutsche Bank, Credit Swiss, Nomura, and it is as of yet unknown how much exposure other banks have to Archigos Capital, the hedge fund. So in this video, we are going to cover number one, how and why this happened. Number two, why is this causing such significant losses with these globally systemically important banks that are supposed to be highly regulated to prevent them from having access or investing highly concentrated positions in highly risky uh, funds or securities. And then number three, we're gonna look at whether this is actually a big deal and what the chances are that this might not just be a one-time loss, but it could potentially be a the first push of a small domino that turns into a catalyst for larger systemic risk down the line. Ready? Let's dive in. Archigos Capital is a hedge fund run by Bill Huang, former Tiger Asia manager. Now, one unique trait of this specific hedge fund is its high concentration in specific stocks. Another characteristic of this hedge fund, though it is not so unique, is its use of high or extreme leverage. Now, obviously, when these two characteristics are combined, these are a powerful recipe for massive gains, but on the other side, it's a powerful recipe for very large losses as well. And here's why. When you're using leverage to buy stocks, you're just borrowing cash in order to make the purchase. So let's say you want to spend $100,000 and you want to purchase stock of Amazon, but you only have $50,000. That's fine. Just borrow the other $50,000 from your broker. You put up $50,000. They put up the other $50,000 for you. You can buy $100,000 worth of Amazon. Now, what happens if something crazy that's not supposed to happen actually does happen? And let's say simultaneously, there are earthquakes all across the earth that their only effect is they crumble all Amazon warehouses. Well, pretty quickly, probably overnight, Amazon's stock would drop, I don't know, maybe 80% overnight. Might be an overreaction considering how much revenue they derive from other sources like AWS, but let's just say 80% they drop overnight. You originally bought $100,000 worth of Amazon, so it drops 80%. How much is your position worth now? $20,000. How much did you originally borrow to make the purchase? You put up 50,000, you borrowed how much? 50,000. How much do you owe now that the position is only worth 20,000? Well, you still owe $50,000. It's debt based on the number of dollars you borrowed, not the position size. You borrowed 50,000, you owe 50,000. So this is a problem because if you sell all of your Amazon stock right now, which yesterday was worth $100,000, today it's only worth 20. So if you sell it all, you only have $20,000, but you still owe $50,000. That means if you sell it all and use that 20 pay it back, you still owe them $30,000. So in this case, your broker would issue what's called a margin call. It'd say, hey, if you sell everything right now and give us that money back, you still owe us $30,000. We're not comfortable with this because now we're in a position where we don't know if you'll be able to pay us back the money that you owe us. So immediately you have to deposit 30,000 extra dollars in your account or else we're gonna close down your account for you to limit our own losses. And so you say, okay, that's fine. I've got 30 grand in my checking account. So I just transfer that over. And now that goes to pay off the first 30 grand of the loan. So now you owe them $20,000 more and uh, you, you've got a position worth $20,000 now. So you've got, uh, you, you've got no issue now. You're you're back to back to green, back to even, back to whole, considering your equity to loan ratio. Now, what happens if you don't have 30 grand sitting in the checking account? Well, you've got three options. Number one, you can borrow the money from somebody else because your broker's not going to give you that money because they're telling you, hey, you got to pay off the loan that you have right now. You can go borrow the money from somebody else. Number two, you could sell other assets, other positions in order to free up some cash. Let's say you've got a brokerage account somewhere else. You've got a car, you got a house, whatever it is. You sell some other assets, bring that money into the account, and then lastly, the third option is simply default. You just it can't pay it back. Now, the first option, let's say if you borrow it, all that does is uh, extend the time. It gives you a little bit of extra time, but it tightens the noose around your neck because if it gets worse and starts to go down even more, now you're in even a worse position than you were before. 
you've added to your debt and your assets have gone down further in value. Now, if you take door number two and you sell other assets in order to free up positions, normally that works if number one, you're a small enough investor to do that. And number two, if your other assets haven't been dropping in value along with the one asset that's giving you the margin call. In today's day and age, more and more assets are becoming more and more highly correlated, especially when you look at stocks. Now, if you're a big enough player, when you go to sell some of your other stocks in order to free up cash, you might be the biggest seller. You might be selling so much of it because you need to free up a billion, two billion, three billion dollars that as you sell, there's not enough money coming in to buy those shares you're selling at the price that they were before you started your selling. So maybe they're at $100 when you start to sell them, but you're selling so many, there's nobody willing left to buy them at 100. Maybe there's somebody willing to buy them at 90, so now you have to sell your remaining shares at 90. But then you you blow through all the, all the buyers who are willing to buy at 90, now you have to sell them at 80 because that's where the next set of buyers are. And so if you have to liquidate large positions and you are a very large player in that market, you might have to come away with a lot less cash than you originally thought was possible simply because you had to sell them so fast. Just look at Viacom and Discover. You look at these two stocks and you can see the impact that Archigos Capital having to fire sell these stocks had on them. They dropped pretty much 50% in the course of one or two trading days. Now, did anything fundamental change in these companies over that amount of time? Absolutely not. This was simply the result of somebody who had too large of a position somewhere and needed to raise the cash. When they were looking at these positions before they started selling, they thought they were going to have a lot more cash they could draw on, but they were forced to sell so quickly that the amount of cash they were able to draw out of this when they're turning equity into cash was a lot less simply because there was not enough buyers to come in and soak up all of their sell. Now, the last option, let's say you don't have any cash to draw and you can't borrow from anybody else and you don't have enough, you know, any other assets to sell in order to uh, free up the cash, you default, right? That's your third option. And that is precisely the position that Archigos Capital found themselves in over the last couple of days. Now, the primary banks who were most exposed to Archigos Capital are going to be Nomura and Credit Suisse. Credit Suisse, obviously a Swiss bank, and then uh, Nomura, that's a Japanese bank. Now, obviously, when the positions and the balance sheet of Archigos Capital started looking bad, they gave uh, Archigos a, a, a margin call and they said, hey, look, you're getting to the point where if you liquidate everything, you're not going to be able to pay us back. So we need you to post some collateral. We need you to deposit some cash. Archigos Capital was unable to do so. And so now these banks, and these are the biggest ones, there's other banks with exposure, but these are the biggest ones. They have anywhere, it's unknown yet, but anywhere between one and $4 billion worth of losses that they're looking at from this. Now you might be thinking to yourself, boo-hoo, big banks lose billions of dollars, big whoop, why do I care? Serves them right. And fair enough, I agree. The problem is the financial system, especially today, is Number one, so over leveraged and number two, so interconnected that this could spark, this could be like a catalyst that starts causing much bigger problems down the line because this isn't the first time something like this has caused much greater problems. In the late 90s, there was a hedge fund called Long-Term Capital Management. They were highly leveraged. All of the banks were investing in them because it looked like they had a foolproof way to invest. They were making tons of money. And when they ultimately failed, Wall Street mainly bailed them out. And uh, the Federal Reserve helped out as well, which coincidentally was the first time Wall, uh, the, the Federal Reserve stepped in to uh, prevent a hedge fund from failing. And the reason is because this hedge fund, LTCM, long-term capital management, it was just so over leveraged. And the reason they were so highly leveraged is because they were investing in a way that they thought there's no way these positions can turn against us. They had offsetting positions. So that if one went down, the other one should theoretically go up and they should offset each other. And the difference between the two was going to be so small that they had to use a lot of leverage in order to make sure that they were making enough money for their investors. Well, eventually when it did go against them, they couldn't liquidate because when you're long this one that's going down and you're short this one that's going up, if you try to close that position out, that means you're buying this one, which drives it up more and you're selling this one, which drives it down more. And so as they tried to close out their risk and close out their positions, the rest of their book got way worse. And many of the large banks were way overexposed to this hedge fund. And so they all had to get together and bail them out. Otherwise they could have risk collapsed themselves. And we saw it again about 10 years later, there was a small, issue in subprime mortgages wiped out an overexposed bank. I don't know if you've ever heard the word Lehman Brothers. Oh yeah. And then it almost took out the entire global financial system. Now, hear me out. I am not saying that this is definitely something that is going to cause global financial systemic risk. 
I am not saying this is definitely going to wipe out the banks. I am not saying this is a catalyst for something more. It's definitely possible. Everything we saw today over the last couple of days, this is the extent of the losses, certainly. But number one, we don't know the exposure that some of the other banks have, specifically Tarchigos Capital. And the problem is bank balance sheets, especially the GSIBs are so interconnected that these losses can spill over into each other. And it's a cascading effect. It's a positive feedback loop where losses over here prompt selling or closing out of positions that cause even more losses in those same positions that somebody else is still uh, holding on to. And so something like this does actually have potential to threaten the stability of of the entire global financial system. And the main reason for this is particularly because of the precarious nature, the fragility in GSIB balance sheets, specifically the uh, Eurozone uh, banks. The way that many of these globally systemically important banks, especially in Europe, have constructed their balance sheets is uh, commonly referred to as picking up pennies in front of a steamroller. It's the same thing that long-term capital management did back in the 90s, just with uh, different variations and tighter risk management. You basically have two positions, you're short one, you're long the other, and so if one goes down, the other one should go up and vice versa. And when you open up the position, there's a little bit of a difference. And so in order to make enough money, you just use a ton of leverage. And now you've got a high likelihood of making a little amount of money. But we know that as in anything with investing, if you have a high likelihood of success, that means you have a small limited upside. Think of like a CD or a bond. The chances of you making your money on it are almost guaranteed, but uh, that means that the amount of money you're gonna make on it is very small and it's limited. Similarly, they have a very small likelihood of failure. The chances of them just completely failing or uh, moving against them is very small, meaning that the downside, if that failure does happen, is extreme or uh, complete, potentially up to 100%. Think of it like a reverse lottery ticket. Would you play the lottery if you uh, went and pressed the button and it gave you $2? And every single time you press the button, it would give you $2. But there was a, you know, let's say a one in a million chance that if you press the button, you'd have to pay out $500 million. Well, if you're anything like the banks, you are gonna play this game. Now you might be thinking to yourself, this the, the losses though are, uh, are so extreme. This doesn't really make sense. How could losses from one hedge fund spilling over into just the exposure that a couple big banks have in that hedge fund, which it's not their only position, obviously, how could it cause a 16% drop in Nomura in one day and a 14% loss in Credit Suisse in one day. That seems like a little bit of an overreaction on the market, right? Well, it has to do with their balance sheet to market cap ratio. You see, these banks themselves, like I've said a couple times, are themselves extremely over leveraged. So you take a bank like Deutsche Bank, and I'm using Deutsche Bank just because it's one of the most extreme examples right now. But their market cap to balance sheet ratio is somewhere around 1.7, what somewhere in between one and a half and two percent. So here's what that means. Right now, their market cap is $25 billion. That's their share price multiplied by the number of shares that there are. It's their total market capitalization. Now, if their balance sheet the, all of the assets and liabilities added up together, every, everything they own, their balance sheet, which is like maybe your investment account, your portfolio, your 401k, your trading account, if their balance sheet has a loss of 0.8%, that's equal to about $13 billion. That means their share price overnight would theoretically have to drop in half because they lost $13 billion. They're only worth total $25 billion but they've got a balance sheet so big that if just their balance sheet loses 0.8%, that's about $13 billion enough to wipe out half of their total market cap. That means if their balance sheet had a 2% loss, it would wipe out 100% of their market cap. Their share price should theoretically go to zero. Now, obviously the odds of something like this happening are extremely low. It's not like their balance sheet is just a, uh, you know, a, an S&P 500 fund. Their balance sheets themselves are all made up of offsetting positions. So that if one of their positions goes down, theoretically another position should go up an equal amount. But extreme environments can cause unexpected or very unlikely things to happen. And many times all you need is a catalyst. Now, admittedly, Credit Suisse, no more, these are not the most over leveraged uh, banks out there. They don't have the worst balance sheets, especially compared to some of the banks in the Eurozone. But like I said before, the investments and balance sheets of all of the GSIBs are very interconnected and they all have positions that if not relying on each other are very similar to each other. And so losses in one place can very quickly spill over to losses somewhere else that can cause a cascading effect of more and more closing out of positions that makes the entire system worse. What 
What affects one will affect another one, at least to some degree. And if one hedge fund can cause a 50% drop in one stock or two stocks or three stocks, causing that hedge fund to default can spill over and cause a 16% drop in a globally systemically important bank in one day, then the real concern with this is that it's not over yet. The real concern is that this is just the first domino and it's just been pushed over and that the losses and the selling that have taken place so far and have been isolated to a few banks and a few stocks are just the beginning. As always, thank you all for watching so much. I really appreciate you more than you know. Have a good day.